Good afternoon. I am Steve Swain, a professor of music here at Dartmouth College and the director of the college's Montgomery Fellows Program. We gather today on the ancestral homelands of the Western Abenaki who were and are part of the Wabanaki Confederation. I remind those of you who are not part of the Dartmouth community that there is a sign-up sheet at the back of the room. We need your uh, name and email address in case we need to contact people because of contact tracing. Perhaps you saw the story about St. Michael's College today and Halloween celebrations, and that's just downright scary. All right. The Montgomery Fellows Program brings exceptional people to an exceptional place. That exceptional place, of course, is Dartmouth College, but it also is the Montgomery House on Occam Pond, which was purchased in 1977 through the generosity of Kenneth Montgomery, class of 1925, and his wife, Harold. Our fellow today is the college's 260th resident fellow who comes to share with us his life and wisdom. This term, the Montgomery Fellows Program partnered with faculty from the departments of anthropology and classics to explore from various perspectives questions surrounding cultural heritage and who gets to say what belongs to whom. I encourage you to go to our website, montgomery.dartmouth.edu, to see who has come we're in the process of uploading the public lectures for those who have already come to campus. And the lecture by Salima Ikram, distinguished professor of Egyptology at the American University in Cairo, is awaiting you there now. At last night's dinner with today's lecturer and his wife, I had to ask him about what the proper term of art is for the field of study in which he works. Are they hominids or hominins? The latter, I was told. And over the course of our conversation, we talked about other names that have shifted over the years. Two terms I recall from our wide-ranging conversation are Tanganyika, which I recall from my childhood, and Lake Nyansa, which is not to be confused with Lake Nyasa. You'll have to ask what the difference will be. We also talked a bit in his absence about the gentleman who will be introducing today's speaker. Our introducer's Dartmouth biography explains that, and I quote, he is a paleoanthropologist specializing in the locomotion of the first apes, hominoids, and early human ancestors, hominins. As our speaker humorously remarked to me last night, the study of locomotion involves the study of feet, meaning that my colleague has something of a foot fetish. <laughs> As I have traversed the campus over the years, I've heard nothing but good things about Jerry De Silva, foot fetish or not. And I congratulate him on the publication this year of his book, First Steps, How Upright Walking Made Us Human, which received a glowing review this April in the New York Times. Won't you join me in welcoming Professor De Silva? Thanks, Steve, I think. Um, it's a real pleasure to introduce today's uh, speaker and Montgomery Fellow uh, and a, a good friend and a close colleague, uh, Dr. Charles Musiba. He's a professor of anthropology at the University of Colorado, Denver. Uh, a native of Tanzania, he earned his PhD from the University of Chicago in 1999. And his research explores the link between human evolution and climate change in ancient times, a science called paleoecology. Also, the process of fossilization, something called taphonomy, and the paleobiology of Pleistocene hominins, including Australopithecus in Eastern Africa. My students out there, you know that's my favorite. And Homo naledi in South Africa. Charles is the permit holder of the amazing fossil locality you're going to hear about tonight, uh, Liatoli in northern Tanzania, where bipedal footprints were first discovered in 1976. 
In 2019, I had the amazingly great fortune of being part of his research team at Lyotoli, and it was one of the most enjoyable and rewarding field experiences of my career. There were a number of other Dartmouth students there as well, an undergraduate, Anjali Prabhat, and graduate students, Kate Miller and Luke Fannin, uh, who, are, who are here. Um, we had a lot of fun in that field season, made some great, great finds in the field. We were visited by Josh Gates of Expedition Unknown. <laughs> and I believe that it's the only Expedition Unknown that they had to bleep out a swear from uh, our distinguished speaker this evening <laughs> upon discovering a hominin canine that had been planted the day before. <laughs> um, wherever we went in Tanzania, everyone knew Charles. Uh, whether it was a, a restaurant in Karatu, a hotel in Arusha, throughout Laetoli, or a traffic stop, the cops knew King Musiba. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure to, to work with him, and I look forward to doing that uh, in the future as well. And one other quick story, uh, Professor Musiba camps in style. We had a great time at this, uh, uh, this fossil site and this, this campsite, but it was like the, the Harry Potter tent that you walk into, and it's enormous. It just keeps unfolding. Professor Musiba's tent was as big as he is in his personality in this enormous, wonderful tent uh, that, that, that held our distinguished speaker this evening, uh, Montgomery Fellow, and let's welcome to Dartmouth, uh, Charles Musiba. Thanks a lot, Jerry. Um, <laughs> I don't know where to start, but um, uh, good afternoon or good evening. Uh, I'm actually honored to be here and to share a little bit some stories with you about our quest for understanding human origins, who we are, how we got where we are, and where do we find fossils. But um, today I will be talking about some, probably one of the few unique sites uh, in the world when it comes into human origins. And that's Laetoli up in northern Tanzania. And basically, Laetoli is situated right here by close to the Lake Victoria, which actually Steve sort of hinted about and called it Lake Nyanza which should be the proper term for that lake because it was never discovered by the British. In fact, they were shown by the locals where the lake was. And instead, they named it after the, the Queen of England as actually a birthday present, which is absurd, but it <laughs> happened. Um, so Laetoli is up uh, right here. Uh, and it's one of the two very important sites in Eastern Africa. Of course, everybody knows Oduvai Gorge, where the Likis spend their lifetime actually doing some um, archaeological work. But today we are taking a journey to Laetoli, and in time back about 3.56 million years ago. Now imagine. Um, and this journey is going to bring us to a locality here, which is called uh, Locality 8 at Site G, where in 1976-78, um, um, Mary Leake and her co-workers discovered one of the earliest evidence about uh, human upright posture and bipedalism, basically the footprints. Um, those footprints actually uh, were discovered and uh, have been geologically sort of uh, placed in uh, this horizon here, which is actually one of the tuffs, sort of volcanic ash, uh, named as Tuff 7, which has been dated radiometrically to about 3.78 to about 3.56 million years ago. And, and of course, here is the prints themselves. 
as they were discovered uh, and excavated by Mary Leek and her co-workers. And just to give you a little bit some idea of this site, Laitoli and this in itself is about 170 square kilometers long. So it's a huge site. And it's a site which has got some challenges. And today I'll be talking about those challenges, which are how do you conserve uh, the ichnofossil or sort of trace fossils like the footprints, uh, especially after we have excavated them. So archaeological work is great, but it's also destructive. We should know that. Once you excavate, of course, then you have to preserve them. And preserving some of these prints is a huge challenge. Um, the prints were actually discovered by Mary Leek and her co-workers. Here there are two individuals which I like to actually talk about. The late Andrew Hill, who was a professor at Yale, and Kay Berensmeyer. Uh, back then, in 1976, they were graduate students who actually have been invited by Mary Leakey to work with her at Old Vi Gorge. And they ended up ventured, uh, venturing into, Old Vi, uh, into Laitoli, where they actually sort of did some work out there. One evening, on the way back from the site, they get bored. And in the course of that, being bored, uh, they started actually playing some Frisbee with elephant dunks. <laughs> Jerry has actually sort of spent about two pages on that story in his book, which I was actually laughing when I was reading about it, because I could visualize both Andrew Hill ducking sort of an upcoming sort of projectile from Kay, uh, Kay Berensmeyer and, and, and Abel, Abel, Dr. Abel. But what is very interesting about that is that the, the first prints to actually have to be discovered was not these G prints, which I would be talking about. It was the A prints, which actually Jerry and I, uh, in 2019, revisited this site and actually looked at them. Now, why the A prints didn't get much attention was because originally they were thought to be either left behind by a bear Of course, the discussions uh, has ensued, and, and, and we have revisited this site. And actually, um, thanks to Jerry, we, uh, we have an article which is actually has been accepted in Nature and will be coming out soon, hopefully, and in which we'll be discussing about that, those prints as well. But these prints are very, very important. The Laetoli prints so far. One may argue that there are prints in other parts of the world, which are actually probably older than the Laetoli prints. That yes, there are prints in Crete, in Crete, Crete Island, which actually are actually supposed to be about eight million years old. Whether they're actually hominin prints, that's a question where we absolutely have no idea. There are no fossils sort of associated with them. But the Laetoli prints, have actually fossils associated with them, Australopithecus sapphorensis. And not only Australopithecus sapphorensis, and we also have another species, uh, Paranthrop uh, Paranthropus ethiopicus, a little bit younger at the same site, and another species which actually we don't know yet uh, where actually it's, it fits in, but within the same time period where these prints actually are. So we have various contenders who could have left those prints behind? So the prints um, at Laetoli were left behind by hominins, who the scenarios actually go as we tell the story. And I like one of the most inter interesting story about them is the I Love Lucy story, which you see at the Natural History Museum um, in New York, in which they say, you have two individuals uh, who probably were in love, walked around with their young one sort of following in the steps. Um, and they have those prints after a volcanic eruption. And so they are walking towards the sunset. Uh, oh, as people have said, could have been two individuals 
and one carrying a baby uh, on a hip, uh, which we always see that, and, and that they're also walking away from a volcanic eruption. And there is another scenario in which three individuals actually walked, uh, two with the same kind of stature, uh, sort of li leaving their prints behind, and a third individual sort of walked into those prints and actually sort of overprinting the other. But the biggest question has been the source of those print, uh, source of the volcanic ash, which actually preserved the prints. So you have a volcanic eruption about, which was followed by a sequence of maybe seven to 14 days, as actually Richard Hay, uh, a geologist who actually looked at the sediments, suggested that you have a volcanic ash, that volcanic ash after volcanic eruption nearby. So you have all these um, volcanic ash being swept on the ground, and then, of course, it rained. And that, that, that volcanic ash became muddy, and then as it was drying, these hominins actually walked by, and then followed later by another volcanic eruption, which actually sort of covered those prints and preserved them until they were discovered in 1976. So the biggest question has been the source of those volcanic ash. There is actually two contenders. There is one, one mountain which is about uh, three miles away from the site, and, and that's uh, mountain Lemagruti, and then there is another site uh, which could be possible, uh, the one which actually uh, a source for that volcanic ash within the area, and that's actually the Sadman uh, Mountain. And the Sadman Mountain is about 50 kilometers, yeah, about 50 kilometers away from the site. So here is actually a, um, a geochemical analysis to show the footprint turf in relation to the other sources um, and the minerals which have been found into that, in, within that, uh, that turf. And they, are sim they have similar characteristics or signature to what actually sort of the volcanic ash at Sadman uh, is, rather than the one about 2.5 kilometers away. Uh, so these, these, these are some of the questions which uh, we always ask ourselves, and we have been asking, and now we, we're getting to sort of narrow down um, to which actually sort of volcanic eruption was the source for the preservation of those footprints. The other thing is that when we talk about the Lytol footprints, we also like to know who left those prints behind. And so far, there is some agreement although I'm a little bit skeptical about it, uh, that actually Australopithecus afarensis would have been the one who left those footprints behind. Now, the reason I'm saying that I'm skeptical about it, it's because at that particular time, uh, we're starting to see in East Africa that more than one species of our ancestors was actually occupying the landscape, both at Laetoli and then other sites like in Ethiopia, we are seeing the same. There is one speci specific specimen I will refer to, which is known, nicknamed as Kadanum, um, one of the largest Australopithecus afarensis, probably, although it has not necessarily been properly assigned to that, uh, to that taxon, but putatively that could have been uh, another sort of male Australopithecus which is probably larger, almost twice as large as Lucy. Uh, so, of course, other evidence which are also important is the comparative analysis on the pedomorphology, which Jerry actually has spent a lot of time uh, looking at those, those foot elements uh, from various hominins and trying to figure out about uh, the gait patterns of various hominins and which one would actually fit in into the Lytoli footprints. But of course, that's those questions we still, 
we are still asking, and we, we, we're going to be continue to ask, uh, asking these questions even more as we get more evidence. So uh, during the discoveries of these prints by Mary in 1976, 78, and 79, she did a very meticulous work excavating the entire trail and basically mapping individual prints, taking accurate measurements. And then photogrammetric work was done by Mike Day, uh, who presented some, uh, one of the earliest evidence about uh, the uh, biomechanics of the, the, those, the printmakers. And by looking at the different sort of uh, weight transfer which could be seen on those prints. Now, of course, here we see Mary's work after she did mapping. She actually made a cast, and several casts, not only one, but three. One is at the Natural History Museum, uh, one is at the Kenya National Museum in Nairobi, where she actually sort of, most of the specimen from Tanzania used to be sent there. And then one is at the National Museum in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. And one is actually at Old Vai Gorge, which is this one here. Uh -huh. And then Mary, of course, after the excavation, she decided to re rebury those prints. What she did, which was very clever back then, because at the time, paleoanthropologists, we were not really prepared in terms of conservation of prints like that. We, did, we had no idea how to conserve them. And Mary did what she could do best, which was mimic uh, the natural environment where the prints were found, and she reburied them by using sand, um, a little bit of um, volcanic ash, and, and cotton soil, basically clay, and on top, she had some volcan uh, volcanic borders. Not this much, but a little bit of that. And those prints lasted until 1986, um, in which she constantly used to go to the side because she was at, living at Odvai Gorge. So Odvai Gorge and Naitoli, they're about 45 minutes away from each other. And so she could travel back and forth. So when she... Um, when she retired in 1986, so the custodian of this uh, paleoanthropological site, basically the Tanzanian Antiquities Department, took over but neglected this site. As a result, um, there was an outcry about, about the site and acacia trees started to grow. This is the original um, barrio which Mary Rick had. And then so you got all these acacia trees growing around it. And then of course, the Getty Conservation uh, volunteered to do some conservation work at Laetoli in collaboration with the Antiquities Department. Interesting enough, even though there were actually a lot of acacia trees growing right on the side, but very few, actually only one print was actually damaged, which is a miracle to some extent. So the Getty Conservation did some conservation work for the two years, uh, and then they reburied them, the prints. But one of the problem with this work was that there were unintended consequences. The fact that this side, if you look at it, this is about uh, the depth of this side. It's about, I would say, about 10 to 12 inches uh, deep in, in various areas. And in some places, about only two to three inches deep. When they buried it, that site, they used seven different layers, including anchor mat, which is used on road construction, bio barriers, two layers of bio barriers and fine sand and also uh, cotton soil and then 
volcanic uh, borders on top. So from about 12, uh, 12 inches, that mound is about 36 inches. Of course, one of the problems with that, when it rains, that water becomes actually trapped in that, in this press. It doesn't go anywhere. And the nature of the, the tough where actually the uh, prints are preserved, it's volcanoclastic. So it's got clay minerals in it uh, and ash. Uh, so when it rains, it's actually sort of, it becomes very wet, becomes waterlogged, water does not go through very quickly, and of course you end up with sediment dissolution. And we'll be talking about that a little bit more. Here to just give you an idea on a cross section of the, of the work they did. So here is the layer of the prints, and here are the various layers which they covered up on the top. And then also with that layer, some of these areas where you have bio barriers, uh, layer three, right, and two, uh, this layer, and, and then uh, his bio barrier, which actually also was impregnated with uh, Roundup. And, and okay, so sure, you can use Roundup, but the site where this site, this, uh, these prints are, it's a national park. It's a Ngorongoro conservation area. So you're using Roundup. And this is not only a national park, it's a man, just to be, it's a man and biosphere reserve. It's a World Heritage Site. And so all of these issues, of course, uh, one did not carefully think about the implications for this, uh, this conservation exercise. But Anyway, just to give you an idea where I'm going with this, uh, with this story. Um, so here's the work, just in details, in 1986. Uh, various work which has been done, actually sort of extracting some of these um, acacia roots. And this, these acacia roots, they look so big, but the trees are actually small. And that's another thing which Probably we didn't think about it back then when, when this work was done. So interesting enough, you can have an acacia about 10 meters away from the site, which I will show later. And still, these roots will really find the water. Uh, so the, the, it's amazing, these, these trees. They, they grow in actually in a dry, arid environment. So they're actually adapted to actually finding water in different ways. So there was a lot of surprises when we reopened the footprints for monitoring, trying to figure out what to do. But <clears throat> so this is the final work after they extracted all the, the roots and put some ground up everywhere. Um, it was covered again. So, these are some of the bio barriers I'm talking about, and this fine sand right on top of the footprints, and sort of followed by another sort of um, addition of fine sand, and then, of course, another bio barrier, and then, and then of course, uh, some clay matrix, and, and, and then at the end, you end up with uh, the volcanic border. <clears throat> so, that brings me to past that conservation efforts. In 2010, uh, the Tanzanian president visited this site with his son. Um, he was surprised to find this mound here, and his son was so upset that actually he took a 10 years old to this site to show them the footprints and to, to discover that actually just it's a mound. And then the, that kid was so upset. Um, managed to influence his father to actually do something about it. I say, okay. And then of course the president decided the prints should be reopened. P 
People should have access to them. People should look at them because they belong to the people who live in those areas. And this site, of course, is a World Heritage Site. So there was a lot of discussion going back and forth between the World Heritage Center, which didn't want anything to be done, the Getty Conservation, on another hand, which didn't want those prints to be open because they've signed a contract when the, when the work was done that those prints should never be open until 50 years later. So, so these were dynamics and discourses which actually sort of ended up uh, prompting a lot of outcry by the Tanzanians. And, and I, I one, one, one day I received an email asking me if I could be part of the team which actually could reopen the prints and have a look at them. So I did agree graciously and said, you know, I will go and, and work with them. But I said, we need to get the Getty Conservation people who actually worked on these prints out here. So the president sent an, a letter to Getty Conservation, and Getty Conservation said, no, we are not going to be coming. First of all, we don't trust the Tanzanians. You are bas basically, the attitude was, we are the expert. You have to listen to us. We can't listen to you. I have actually, interesting enough, the letter which they sent, the Getty Conservation sent to Tanzania, it ended up on my desk. Somebody said, Charles, you work in the US. How should we answer this letter before they showed it to the president? Because people were afraid, because it, was a, it wasn't written in a, in a good language, basically. It was not diplomatic. It was just, you guys know nothing about this. We know better. So I, I drafted a letter. I didn't want to share it with you. I can have it on my laptop. I drafted a letter, and the Tanzanian uh, president actually signed it. And then we sent it to the Getty Conservation. Within 24 hours, they agreed to come. Um, which was great. It was a very nice letter telling them why we thought that it was important to do what we, we needed to do. But some of the problems at this site include um, issues basically with water. Uh, so you get a site in which you get, when it rains, it's on, a, it's on actually on a slope, right? And then when it rains, you get all these flash floods, and they, they bring that water to the site. And rather than that water basically going over, it, it gets sort of it gets retained around the site. That's one. And then, of course, you also have water accessing site, also underground aquifers. You get some water. So you get water runoff. You got underground water. And of course, with that, you get chemical weathering uh, on the footprint tough. And also, because of temperature fluctuations in the summer, uh, you still have water logged on, on, on the side. And then with that evap uh, evaporation, and, and you end up with some temperature fluctuations. And that actually causes some, the volcanic ash actually expands like clay and contracts. So you get cracks in the footprints. Um, and, uh, and also, when you expose them, when you excavate them, if they are wet, within two hours, with changes in the humidity, then also you get some problems. So there's uh, so much issues there which we have to think about. And then, of course, there's all these other issues with acacia trees um, and their roots. Also, burrowing insects, which also find these absolutely incredible places uh, for them to, to live. There is water. Uh, so, so all of these are problems which uh, one has to be thinking about. Just to give you an example, here, when it rains, that's a colleague of mine, uh, the late uh, Simon Mataro. Um, this was shot after a very short rain, which rained about two hours and then you end up with this kind of erosion, right? 
So, so that's huge problems. And then I talked about uh, chemical weathering. And then you get with the underground water, you end up with carbonate build up on site. So this is, a, this is actually a footprint tough, and you get this carbon build up all over. And then when you have this caliche, and then actually you end up with some uh, fissures at the end of the day, you end up with some fissures, and those actually could, could also destroy the site, which actually they did. Uh, and then of course, we did the test looking at the site um, in terms of humidity in seven day measurements, and actually, it fluctuated in, in which sometimes this variation between just the ambient temperature and on the site itself was about 44%. Uh, and, and so all of these, of course, they have great implications on the preservation of those prints. Uh, and then, of course, temperatures well, uh, fluctuations, and you end up with this cracking. So it's really complex. I mean, that volcanic ash is not like a very hard sandstone like you see when you see a dinosaur footprint sites, right? This is, this is delicate, and, and it, needs, it needs to be looked at in a much more different way than the approach which uh, we have been used before. Uh, so, so when we think about this sort of conservation and we go back, um, and thanks to the media, when people write something like that, it helps. Because then more people pay attention to this problem. And that has resulted in a much more sort of sustained and, and best practice at, uh, practice at, the, at the site in which Every five years, we have what we call periodic monitoring in which we open the prints. But of course, that's not a safe way to do it because every time you're opening those prints, chances are you may actually sort of destroy them during the excavation. It's also very high. Um, so, so especially when you have a site with a mound like that, uh, so in 2010, we did some excavation. Um, and then after we did that excavation, we tried to figure out how much of this weight burden, overburden out here, um, how heavy it is, and how actually it could be interacting with the footprint tough itself. And, and I would be talking about that. But just from the uh, quick calculations which we had done, uh, for the static pressure, we get about 1,000 uh, kilogram per square meter. Um, and this is about 30 meters long. So you're actually having an overburden, which actually sort of um, have a greater implications on the, on the, on the site itself. Uh. So during that work, we decided, uh, we worked with people, uh, some of my colleagues from Bureau of Land Management here in the US and who actually do photogrammetric work. Uh, let's see a Tom, actually sort of, we, we recorded everything. Um, and, and just for the archives to make sure that we have every, all kind of information we can. Uh, and you can see this site, even though every year uh, there was, was an individual who would be cleaning up uh, this site. And you can see Acacia during the rain season they would just come back, all those acacia trees. Uh, so, and here's one of those examples. Um, as we were excavating, the first thing we encountered were these roots from acacia trees, but we, we are not seeing the trees anywhere across by. Uh, and then of course, as we reached to the print surface itself, we encountered another problem. So you have fine sand which has actually been put on uh, sort of on top of the prints. So because of the rain and water logging, you get a chemical reaction between silica and the volcanic ash. And they sort of, you get all these uh, adherence uh, of the sand to the prints, 
we couldn't clean them anymore without damaging them. So, so we had to stop. But here's where we, went, we actually went wrong. Remember I talked about, about uh, Roundup. These, these, you see these pellets? Those are Roundup. And we found them on the volcanic, on the, on the volcanic tuff itself where the prints are. So we get discoloration, uh, and some actually into the prints themselves. Uh, so that's, that's one. And then, of course, expansion and contraction, you get all these sort of cracking. Uh, that's a print there. You get some cracking out there right here. So you, you start to get all these. Uh, so we end up with that yellow discoloration, uh, of course, um, everywhere on both sides. And then, of course, fracturing of sediments um, and impregnation, a sort of impregnation of the uh, roundup into, into the surface itself. There's got a discoloration of the footprint tuff from the original color. Um, and what we ended up doing was also to look at different sort of um, problems which we could actually sort of document at the site. Um, basically from micro um, cracking, polygonal micro cracking, uh, to soiling and, and, and by, by, by sand with a strong adhesion uh, to the surface in various presses. Here's the print, here's the print, and there's the print. Um, and then we have some areas, remember I talked about the overburden on top. We have some areas in which actually hollowing underground because then you get water coming in, seeping under the volcanic tuff itself and actually sort of leaving some hollow, vo some voids. Um, and we, get, we got those areas right here and in these presses. So all of that was basically one of those um, problems which we have encountered at Laetoli. At Lai, at Lai and, and of course, that, that's a problem which we are trying to deal with. And uh, here, basically, looking again at all these various uh, discoloration, of course, uh, different sort of activities which are actually happening. So, the, the fact that this area here and, and the prints are actually sort of losing their value uh, from a scientific standpoint, uh, there is not much um, one can actually do to reverse that, that, that problem. And the only, the only thing which has been suggested now is that the Tanzanians um, have realized the importance of, this, of these prints, and they would like to do something about it, and which is they want to reopen this site, especially site G. And, and at that site, and open, open a, probably a portion of that prints, half of it, and, and build actually an enclosure as part of actually sort of Vista's site with the museum. Uh, a small museum, and we say actually a research facility in which actually constantly every day they could actually sort of be looking at those prints and seeing if, if there is any changes, which could actually inform them because there is another site, Site S, which is, was discovered in 2016, which also has got footprints and they are actually in a much better condition than the Site G prints. So it will inform us about what to do next on site this. And here we can see, so the yellowing of the prints, um, we tried to clean them up. Um, and it was, um, here we can see that you get the yellowing out there. And then we just used some just alcohol, um, diluted alcohol and tried to clean. Um, and then, of course, later we can see you still have some yellowing, but actually that can be reversed. This, this, this problem can be, uh, can be reversed. Uh, now, the problem which cannot be reversed was the sand. Uh, 
And here, let's have a look. This actually, this is 1995, when the Getty Conservation reopened the prints before they actually did the conservation project. This is in 2011, and this is in 2016. You get more details out here. You still have a little bit of details here. You get obscure details out here. So, so these are some of the major issues uh, which I think it's going to be difficult to deal with, um, how to reverse. One can say we, we, are, we can actually meticulously re-excavate these prints and actually get those sand which are there to the uh, prints. But of course, by doing so, you're going to scratch those prints, and then you're going to you're going to end up in another problem. The whole world is going to say, you ruined those prints. So to conclude about, yeah, let's see. So to conclude, we looked into both the northern and the southern end of the prints. This is the south end of the prints, um, where actually most of the, the best prints were being preserved. Of course, we have discoloration as a problem, and we have dull sounds uh, right here in this area and in this area. And then, of course, we have sand basically um, are they are linked to the prints, which actually can't be cleaned. Um, and here we can actually see these are actually sort of, this is the G2, G, uh, G2, G3, uh, print number 29. Um, and then we have a couple of prints uh, further on this area, which are not, they are not showing, which actually we couldn't even uh, excavate them. And this area here you're seeing here, when we excavated, it was actually, and this was during the summer, in the month of July, which is a dry season in Tanzania. There was basically a lot of water. It took us two days using uh, acid-free paper, basically, to cover that, that sand. And water was still seeping out of the ground. Uh, and we absolutely have no idea where that water was coming from. And I'm glad that the Getty Conservation was with us when we actually opened the prints, because they could see that and realize that, yes, there was a problem with, um, with the work we did, uh, they did. And then, of course, here you have some, some uh, fracturing happening out here. Um, you get out on this side too. Uh, and you get various contamination. This is sort of uh, showing a little bit some of that with, uh, with sand particles. So it is really difficult to clean them up. Uh, and, and then here we can go again um, looking at the same. Uh, so these are some of the problems. And these problems, of course, they need some um, quick, uh, sort of quick action, which is basically figuring out how can we slow down this process. Mm. And uh, even more out here. Um, so so these, these are some of the major issues uh, concerning conservation, which brings me back to the question whose heritage anyway it is. Because you get the get a conservation on one hand, which said, we are the experts. You have the local people who are saying, you know, we're having a problem here. And then, of course, you have this dialogue going on where the Heritage Center comes in and saying, don't do anything yet. Um, and I was at a meeting in April um, 2019. Um, representing uh, with members of the Tanzanian team to actually plead to the World Heritage Center that you have to let us do the right thing about these prints, which is we need to come up with a long-term solution. And one of the, one of the recommendations, finally, the World Heritage Center has agreed to was that Tanzania has to come up with a plan in which uh, if they reopen, the question was, are we building a museum or are we building a visitor center? 
And their concern was, you cannot build a museum there because you have a museum at Old Vygorja, really. <laughs> These two sites are so different from each other. And then one of the other issues was, you need to come up with a landscape approach to reduce soil erosion. I said, that's great. We can do that, but the problem is, the only reason we have this site is because of that soil erosion. Every time it rains, new sediments are actually exposed and we find fossils. Now if you tell us to actually cover that with cotton soil, then there won't be any research work done at Lytoli, right? So these are some of those issues which I think it has to be taken into account. And the problem, which in my opinion, I find with the World Heritage Center after working with them for a very long time, is that people are so detached when they live, they are in Paris, looking at dossiers from everywhere all over the world. They have no idea sometimes. We have actually invited and said, we would like a mission to, Old Vi to, to Laitoli and Old Vigod so that they can see how different these two sites are. Uh, right within that 45 minutes of drive, the landscape changes so dramatically. Uh, Old Vigod is on the plains farther away, and Laitoli is on the western part of the plains, and it's characterized by uh, acacia trees, and, and whereas Old Vigod is just plains, it's short grassland. It's nothing there. Uh, but Old Vygorge has got this beautiful graben, uh, the gully in which actually the gorge itself, where most of the sites are located. At Laitoli, the sites are completely different. So this different sort of deposition environments, which people need to actually be able to, to be aware about and to be able to say, you know, there are two different sites, and maybe they may represent two different sort of histories uh, in terms of our evolution. And, and this is my last slide showing a little bit more um, of the damages out here. Uh, this the areas which actually you could, if you knock on the ground, it's very hollow. You could hear that. And so the question is how long that will last before it collapse? So, Anyway, so these are some of the problems which we have at Lytoli. And then of course, the question now is, what can we do? And the answer to that is that there are a couple of scenarios which have been brought forward, and the Tanzanians are moving forward with, uh, um, with the efforts. If it wasn't for COVID-19, they were supposed to convene a meeting um, last year, which got postponed with experts. Uh, both Jerry and I were supposed to actually sort of go to that meeting and maybe uh, share with some words of wisdom, if we could. Um, has been postponed and probably it's gonna happen next year, depending on situation in terms of COVID-19. But um, the plan is they are moving forward and they have decided whether World Heritage, Site, uh, World Heritage Center likes it or not, they are going to build a shelter at the site, reopen the prints, and photogrammetically monitor them every day. The technology is there. It's low tech. You need a laptop. You need a nice SRL camera with somebody who knows how to take good photos every day in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening then you can compare those um, over time. And then you can make sort of informed decisions what to do about the prints. And I will end up here so that if people have some questions, I'm sorry to be the bear bearer of the bad news about conservation, but uh, yeah, that's some of things which keep me at work sometimes in the night. Yeah, thank you. So let me ask you, if you do have questions, there's a microphone over there. If you'd come to the microphone and ask your question, that way we can 
recorded on the uh, video, and so um, please come forward and ask your questions. Hi, I'm uh, John, I'm an archeologist. I was just curious um, with this shelter idea, after the shelter was put into place, it just, they're just gonna be photograph, like modeling it each day. Um, are you gonna be doing anything else to try to preserve it once it's all exposed, or is it just gonna be just camera lens, or is there any ways to like test it now? It seems like they're degrading so fast. Are there, is there any like experimental things to try to do in other preservation methods now? Yeah, yeah so that's a very good question. Um, yes, he's asking about if there are any plans for more than just what we would be doing by reopening the prints. Yes, there is actually a plan. And the plan was um, first build a shelter and then systematically excavate the prints and then do some uh, conservation work. And we're experimenting with different consolidants, sort of soil consolidants, which actually is the ones which actually can be reversible. So not yeah, and, and so there are a couple of consolidants which actually have been considered. Um, we are testing them at uh, other sites, and then we will really see in the next two, three years um, what type of uh, results we get from those. But the idea is to actually uh, reopen them and then have a team of scientists in residence right outside including conservation. We have, uh, we're, they are training a, uh, a rock conservation um, expert who actually will be, uh, will be, uh, will be out on, uh, in residence. They have a site manager who will be dealing with some of the other issues. And the other thing which I didn't mention but um, they are doing, which are really they're actually working on they are working on a research facility so that to accommodate scientists who actually who will be going to the site to do other work. But that includes also establishing a, geo, a geochemical lab at the site, um, uh, an uh, ecology, landscape ecology um, lab for people doing a lot of ecology work out there. And of course, a paleontology lab. Uh, but these are some of the things which they are, um, they are planning to do. So they have, a, they have about um, $12 million they want to spend on the site just to do a little bit of that work. It's on a small scale. It's not large. But, but the other thing which is really, I'm really happy about what they are doing, they're also doing, they want to turn it into an educational center. So they're going to have maybe uh, accommodation to, to about 20 students who can actually come out um, throughout the year. They will have actually sort of educators at the site to work with the student. And the idea is to, to try to deal with some of the problems, um, not only just the footprint problems, but also other problems. Uh, one of the other problems is climate change, and people are not thinking about how does that actually interact with some of the sites. Old Vygoj, for instance, um, we just did a, a quick satellite imagery sort of study looking at the, uh, the changes in the landscape at Old Vygoj for the past 20 years. It's just amazing to see how those changes and how that influences some of the archaeological sites itself. Uh, at Laitoli, we had a couple of sites located to one of the sites. There are about 32 sites at Laitoli located to, which was actually one of the best sort of fossil preserving sites. It's gone. It's gone in the fact that because of rains, heavy rains, it has, it has been, the site has been washed away. Uh, it's not there anymore. On top of that, you have communities which actually have moved into the area, Maasai communities. So population is another problem at Laitoli. Actually, not at Laitoli, in Ngorongoro Conservation. In, 19, in 1986, there are about 32,000 people 
who lived in Ngor called Ngorongoro Crater their home. There are over 70,000 people now living in the area. And so one of the problems is that you have 70,000 people with about 8 million cows and goats. And they have a greater impact on the, on the landscape. So those are other problems, too, which I didn't actually talk about. But, but it's huge. I mean, Ngorongoro is at a crossroad when we think about it as a site, uh, as, as a World Heritage Center sort of site. It's at a crossroad. You got all these issues. And then, then, of course, on top of that, you have invasive species which have been brought in um, in the area. So all of these, these are confounding sort of problems. And it's just huge in terms of what one can do at a site like that. Yeah. But people are actually thinking carefully about what, what would be the best way. I, I think the mistakes which we had done in the 80s, people have realized that they cannot make those mistakes again. So which my argument has been, it's a great site for teaching conservation about what not to do <laughs> uh, as a site. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. So, um, so at site, there's another site S, right, that you yes. mentioned, and there was photogrammetry done of that site, and I believe there was laser scanning done of it. And then when we worked together in 2019, we did a laser scan of yeah. the, the site A. And so we have these digital copies, right? We have digital replicas yes. of these sites. So I'm wondering if you can say something about um, the value of having those digital copies um, and whether they're a replacement for the originals in some way. Because um, you know, I, I'm really struck by something you said, that the erosive process gave us these prints, right? Yeah. And maybe it takes them. Maybe these oh, are absolutely. things that, maybe these are things that it's, it's sort of a, I don't want to say it's a lost cause, but, but maybe Maybe, maybe they're, we're going to lose them right yeah. through these processes. Yeah. And so are these digital copies uh, sufficient replacements? Or I, what I'm struggling with right now, and I'd love to hear what you think of this, is just our own emotional attachments to the originals. That the place, that spot where three and a half million years ago these hominins walked, yeah. it's different right, than having some virtual copy on my computer. Um, and yet, does it still satisfy all the scientific questions that we may ask of them? So, uh, yeah. yeah, that's a good question, Jerry. Um, yes, digital copies, one can argue that, um, in fact, even the casts, which Mary Ricky did, was, that was the beginning of basically documenting, documenting the prints, which is actually part of a conservation as a strategy in which you you open up the prints, you map them precisely, you make casts, you take those casts, you put them in a museum, or you do, you, you have a repository for them, right? Of course, that's great, but it's the context. You miss sometimes that context. So, uh, yes, the prints, of course, in, in fact, I also argued that we discover these prints by sheer accident because over three and a half million years, they've been eroding. And finally, Andrew Hill ducks down and sees the prints, right? Of course, if it wasn't for that, rain would have actually eroded them. Maybe not in a year, not in 10 years, but eventually. So these are actually resources sort of heritage sort of resources which actually sort of, they're not meant to be permanent, in my opinion. Uh, if you look at the natural process um, in how those prints were let, sort of left behind, preserved, and they re-exposed, they would have actually sort of eventually eroded away. 
There are animal prints at various sites which have actually eroded away, right? So, however, because of that, we cannot necessarily say we should let natural process take place. We, we, we need to help figure out how can we pre better preserve them in situ, right? And so that you have the, you're not losing the context. Yes, you can have digital um, sort of uh, repli replicas of the prints in a three dimension now with the technology. We can, la we can laser scan them, but still, it's different. When you actually imagine going to a museum and seeing the 3D images of the land, of, of the prints, it's different than actually going to the site, standing there and contemplating three and a half million years ago, my ancestors or our ancestors walked on this landscape. You look at the landscape, there is that connection you get, which is, it's very hard to replicate it digitally. I mean, sure, you can do CGI and all that, but, but still it's different. And, and so the, the, there is that aesthetic value as well, the scientific value and the aesthetic value which goes with that, which transforms you when you get back at a site like that. And that's why some of us have been thinking, imagine if you have a shelter, some sort of a shelter out there, and those prints are actually open, they are con in a controlled, in, envir in environmental controlled climate, you could actually sort of, we, there's still a lot more to learn about them in a way that is different. The entire erosion process, everything that, it's knowledge which is important. Actually sort of, we can be transferred to other sites, like site S, right? Which actually it's so different because has got one area where the prints are actually sort of so deep, about a meter deep. Um, and some presses which they're, they're just right on the surface and they are eroding. So all these, one, one has to figure out what, what will be the best, but having both will be the best, sort of best practice in my opinion, rather than just saying, okay, we're just gonna have the digital version of that. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah. Ned? <laughs> I was thinking along the same lines as Jerry, and instead of digital copies, I was thinking of, of physical casts. And given Getty's responsibility of damaging the site, I thought Getty could throw some money behind putting casts in every school in Tanzania. That would be great. And maybe that would be a better use of limited money than trying to preserve it. But then you caught me by surprise by talking about the importance of space. And so I was just wondering about, when it comes to national heritage, is it better to send physical cast to every school, but then, then that disassociates the act from the place? Yeah. And it sounds like you're saying it's better to have kids come to the place and make that direct connection. So I was just, I was just struck by that, and I don't really have a question. It was just, <laughs> just a comment. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Ned. You, you're absolutely right. Um, it's one thing. I mean, I grew up going to a museum, right? And, and, and Maybe I should say it, say it this way. My first visit to the museum was when I was, I grew up on the Lake, Lake Victoria side. The museum was in Dar es Salaam. I went to the museum. Sure, I have read books about Old Vygorge. I've read everything about Sun Tools and all that. And I wanted actually to be, to be an archeologist just because of that reading, that fascinating story. However, it was until I got into a museum, looked at an actual stone tool, and talked to the people who actually were excavating this, which got me even more excited. But the crescendo to that was when Merrick invited me to Old Vygorg, and standing there on that landscape and looking at it, I said, this is what I want to be, right? So, so that's, that connection there and the kids, our idea is to have, if you can bring kids to this site, 
Not only do they learn about our origin, but they get that connection to the land in a way that their imagination, I mean, that serves as actually a laboratory in a sense in which children can explore even more. Thinking about our ancestors, they say, okay, what type of food they were eating, right? But having them around in a place like that, they can actually imagine even better. They can start asking questions which they could not ask it, just in a classroom environment or in a museum. Because they are seeing a lot of things in a completely different perspective. So that, that's the, the whole idea, to try to bring those kids in press like that, and actually let them sort of explore, uh, see their surroundings, work with scientists like you, where they can ask questions, uh, and some difficult questions which will be difficult to answer. You can imagine a 10 years old asking questions. They are much harder than a graduate student asking those questions. Yeah, because they're not afraid about saying something which it's so strange, but they will ask questions, yeah. So that's the idea. I have a question. Sure. I'm not even an amateur at this game, but it strikes me that what you're saying is you'd like to preserve the actual site and have people come and look at what it was like uh, scenery-wise. Well, the scenery three million years ago would have been totally different than what it is now. So what's the point? That's a very good question. You're asking the, uh, exactly the question which a lot of people ask me, which is, was light totally three and, three and a half million years ago the same like today? And the answer is yes and no. Yes in that, and I will start with the yes part. Yes in that part of the ecosystem um, which would have been at light totally three and a half million years ago it's actually has been fragmented, but still, in some places at Light Hall, you can see exactly what it should have been like three and a half million years ago. What type of fauna and flora we know? Uh, the same acacia, 10 different species of acacia, which were, has been actually recognized in a fossil record at Light Hall. Most of those are still around. Fauna. Most of the animals, with the exception of one or two dictic uh, species, um, but the majority of them are still there, with also an exception of another species, Caricothea, um, a three-crowed um, antelope. Um, but other antelopes are still, are still around. So, and, and, and most of the carnivores are still represented within the, uh, the ecosystem with the exception of maybe one or two panthera species which are not, no longer there. But yes, there have been some changes, but those changes have been not so dr dramatically as, as it was three and a half million years ago. And, 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 and the beauty is that there are some localities at Laitoli you can actually go and look on the ground and you can see uh, preserved, well-preserved and fossilized fruits, seeds, uh, and, 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 and tree stumps actually, which suggest that the environment was not that different from what it is today. So that's the other thing again. And when we talk about climate change, of course, now we don't know what's gonna happen like in the next 100 years. You know, there may be a dramatic change. Uh, but those changes, yes, there have been some changes. The landscape has always changed a little bit, but not so dramatically in a sense. 
I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you so much for your talk. I think my, um, it's not really a question, but more like a comment based on what we have been talking about change and preservation like in our previous conversation. So what struck me is that, you know, thinking about the really deep history of those footprints and when they were produced, there was, there's not been constant sort of, you know, disruptions or change, erosions, thinking about those footprints being, uh, you know, in some sort of, in, in some sense changed by the environment. And they were, and I, I, I just, I just have some sort of, a, you know, uh, I'm just thinking about, I'm also an archeologist, yeah. that the role of archeologists, when you open up the trench, you are also doing some sort of uh, change yeah. or disruptions to those footprints and how to present those footprints and telling a history, telling a story about the past. But what we are seeing today at the site is not a really, um, you know, the original preservations of, of the situation when those footprints were produced at the beginning, but just recognizing that there's always this constant change, uh, yeah. change and influences but from humans and non-humans and a variety of um, factors in the environment. So, um, so I think, I don't know if I have a question, but I'm, I'm just wondering about your thoughts about you know, producing this kind of a narrative to um, students or visitors to the museums. And would that be possible to sort of um, recognizing that uh, this is not actually, you know, there, there are a lot of similarities and we want to know that those footprints were in situ and relating to the landscape. But there's actually a, a really complicated history like happened like interacting between those footprints and, 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 and peoples and environments in the past and also in the present day when the archaeologists were actually making some sort of a changes on the site during the preservation as you yeah. have talked yeah. about and also as an effort of protection. You, you just, uh, your comments actually, you just nailed exactly what we are trying to do. Um, we, we actually recognize that our work when we do excavation. Yes, we record everything and we say, this is the geological context, but we remove also some of the geological context, right? So, so when you open up a site, of course, uh, you're doing that as part of the process. So, so the idea which is actually we have was actually to have to have uh, that, that, that shelter and that center, but adjacent to that, there are a couple of other sites with animal prints, not hominins, but animal prints which actually have been, uh, has, have been exposed for a little bit longer, uh, since the 80s, since the 70s, in fact, when Mary Leake worked out there, and we, we have done just some protection, basically, um, basically shielding them from water erosion. But they are, they are, they are left the way they, they, sh they could be. In fact, one of those sites uh, is actually a site where, where Jerry and I, we worked, uh, the site A prints. Um, that was not, was not completely preserved at all. It was just covered the way the way it was found. Uh, and we went back and we excavated and we looked at it and then we covered it again the way it was. It was. Uh, so, so the idea would be to have sites like that as, as actually sort of your um, sites which can actually inform you about the, the natural process without the anthropogenic sort of effect. Uh, so, then you have the other side where you actually have all this preservation work. And that's actually, the two would inform each other um, in which information you gain from these sites which actually sort of left in a natural sort of, sort of I don't know if we should call it natural surrounding, but it's not natural in a sense because humans have been around in those places for a very long time, but in a much more natural 
conditions than the other, which actually we sort of building a shelter on them. So one can actually have a look at those. And the idea is that that can inform us a little bit more about preservation, sort of preservation processes, uh, and also the deposition environment in which these prints have been found in. So if you get one site which is actually sort of not, has not been disturbed by humans, yes, you may have some erosion, and that would inform how we sometimes also discover these sites, right? So you have all this information, sort of, you get uh, this synergy of, in which you see all these different sort of uh, conditions which actually sort of work together to give you a much better uh, sort of information about, about the site itself. Did I hit it right? <laughs> yeah. We'll make this the last question. All right, so I'll ask the last question. Hey, could you turn the microphone forward? Can you hear me? Yes. All right, so my question is centered around like the narratives you build around these footprints. Uh, yes. So Afarensis, I think, was one of our, uh, one of those ancestors that is considered to be bipedal, I think. but. Why is it that we have written off maybe uh, ideas about conflict, uh, people fighting, uh, people running after each other and stuff like that? Uh, are these things possible? Oh, that, that question, so you're asking a question about behavior, right? Yeah, if we I'm, can infer behavior, behavior from, if we can infer behavior from footprints, right? Yeah, and just a little bit of background. So I'm also assuming like, since these were the first sort of ancestors to walk, maybe they're not as fast as we are, and I know there's a little bit of history about how you know, the distance between the uh, left and right foot could sort of predict how these people were uh, like, you know, walking and stuff. Uh, are we, you know, can we assume that they're also slow and they're fighting or running after each other in a very slow way? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. Um, it's an interesting, difficult, and a yet fascinating question, in a sense, and I will answer it. I try to answer it in two ways. Um, first of all, it's actually very hard to predict behavior just based on the footprints. Yes, you can actually sort of estimate speed, uh, how the individual, the speed of the individual is walking. Those are just estimates. It's called relative speed. Uh, you can estimate that. And there has always been a myth, and, and this is, brings me back to when I was doing my graduate studies, um, I read an obscure, it was an obscure journal in the medicine in which somebody actually said people who live in the rural areas, they walk slow. And basically, taking from there, and this individual, turn it around and say, the Lytoli printmakers, we are walking really, really slow. And then I thought to myself, imagine if you had Lytoli three and a half million years ago. You are bipedal. You don't have a gun. You don't have an arrow and ball. The lions, the hyenas, you really want to walk that slow? <laughs> I mean, I was figuring out and trying to think, and so it brought me to, it brought me to start to looking at behaviors of hunter-gatherers. And I worked uh, in the early uh, 90s, uh, I worked with the Hazabe, which actually is sort of hunter-gatherers, the last of the hunter-gatherers in East Africa. And we, uh, Ras Taro, who was my advisor, we worked on, on, on them on gate patterns and prints of the Hadza, to came to realize, actually, they walk faster than, <laughs> than people who live in a city. Uh, so, so that myth it, it has always been there in which actually people thought people are walking very slow. So that's not true, even on farmers. I mean, farmers, when they, if you lived on a farm, people don't walk that slow. Uh -huh because they have places to go and, and have to get there as fast as they could so they can do whatever they want to do, right? So 
Could those hominids, uh, or hominins in this case, I'd like to totally walk that slow? I mean, their speed, which have actually sort of been estimated, and they're not that relatively slow compared to modern humans. They're actually within the range of speed of modern humans. Uh, so, so basically that, that, and that's based on actually looking at their step lengths, foot lengths, and, 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 and be able to actually look into uh, if we could actually estimate their, their, their speed. And their speed actually are within the range of, of uh, normal humans walking rather than being sort of the slowest uh, individuals. On the issue of behavior, warding and all that, and, and all that, that's really hard to tell. Uh, because, I don't know, I mean, it's very hard. That kind of behavior, it's very hard to actually depict from just footprints. And that brings me to the idea which my former uh, advisor had a problem with, uh, with one of an expert in the field of uh, footprint studies who suggested that you can tell somebody's race by actually looking at the footprints. You can't, I'm sorry to say that. So those behaviors, you, you can't predict that kind of uh, information from just footprints. There's a lot of information we can get, but not necessarily that. In fact, even the idea that Australopithecus afarensis left those footprints, it's rooted in the fact that they are actually remains of Australopithecus afarensis. If they were not remains of Australopithecus afarensis, we wouldn't even be able to say that. Uh, and, and Jerry here actually probably we can, can explain it to you even better than I can. Uh, no, he's actually. <laughs> Anybody would know that I'm wearing a kilt based on my footprint. But <laughs> please join me in thanking uh, Dr. McKinney.